Hello world, this is Craig. This is a series of six videos on bit banging a Dallas one wire interface on an ARM Cortex STM32 processor. In the first video, I'm going to cover the background for the one wire interface. In part two, we'll look at some one wire waveforms off our logic probe. In part three, discuss the actual configuration requirements for the port on the Cortex STM32 F4 we're using. Part four, we're going to review the C code. Part five discusses communication with the DS2502-E48, which is a EEPROM with a unique serial number MAC address in it. And part six discusses the Dallas One Wire CRC, how it's accomplished and the code to do that. So what are the advantages of using a one wire? Well, the most obvious advantage is if you're limited in the number of pins available on your device, the one wire interface only takes one wire plus a common. It doesn't even take power. It typically uses parasitic power. While the bus is high, the device stores power to use during a transmit. The devices are designed to be connected and disconnected. So they're easy to protect electronically. Commands can be sent to an entire family of devices at once. So if you have a number of temperature sensors on the bus, for example, you can send out a command and tell all of them to start a analog to digital conversion, for example. There's a nice variety of devices. If you look at the Maxim website, for example, you can see in their one wire page, they have a product tree. You can see there's a number of memory devices, temperature sensors, data loggers. There's some one wire interface products if you don't want to use a one wire port on your device. Some battery products such as battery monitors, battery IDs, and then timekeeping and real time clocks. So a nice variety of devices, they're all compatible on the same bus. And the thing is, if you look at them, they range, you know, these are a particular device. They're, 60 cents, 70 cents, a dollar. Here's one that's $3 a piece, but they're very, very cost effective. The device that we happen to be using for this is a, it's a DS2502E48. This device is a 48-bit node address. In other words, it gives us a worldwide unique 48-bit node address or a MAC address that we use in our products. And we pay about a dollar and a half for these devices. Every device, when it's manufactured, is assigned a unique address, and that can be used for serializing hardware and other applications that require a unique address. So what are the basics of the Dallas One Wire? It's also called DAO or One Wire. Well, first of all, it's a master slave, just like we saw in I squared C or the SPI, the SPI. It's half duplex, as you can imagine, if there's only one wire. Like the SPI and I squared C, the bus is normally floating high and somewhere on that bus is a pull-up resistor. And all devices connected to that bus are open collector or open drain and they can only pull the bus low. Time slots for the communication are each 60 microseconds long and everything starts with a reset when the master pulls the wire low for at least eight time slots. After the release of the wire, any slave that's on the bus should then pull the wire low within the next time slot and hold it low for one time slot to indicate its presence. That's called the presence signal. If there's no presence signal, the master presumes that no devices are available and it will quit. So how does addressing work? So SPI, as you may know, uses a hardwired chip select to identify the slave. And communication with that slave continues until that hardwired chip select is released. I squared C starts each conversation with either a 7-bit or a 10-bit address to identify which slave it wants to communicate with. And communication continues until the stop condition is sent by the master. One wire can use dedicated hardware like SPI or addressing like I squared C. As I mentioned earlier, every device has a worldwide unique address, and that address can be used to identify it on the bus. But if there's a single device on the bus, then addressing is generally not required. If addressing is used, it's a process of elimination, and any device that receives an offending command 
or any device that recognizes that it has not been addressed goes to sleep and it stays asleep until the master issues a new bus reset. Once a slave has been selected, communication continues until the slave receives an excluding address or an offending command. CRC plays an important role in data checking. With the single wire, we need a method of being sure that the information was transmitted and received correctly. And so nearly all packets have a CRC component. So what are the basics of communication? So everything starts when the devices are first powered up. And that can be accomplished by the master pulling the bus low for at least eight time slots or 480 microseconds. So basically what is happening is that since these devices are using parasitic power off the bus, when the master pulls the bus low for this extended period of time, they all run out of power. And so when the master releases the bus and it floats up, all of the devices see that as their first power up. After the release of that wire, all slaves will pull the bus low within the next time slot and hold it for one time slot to indicate their presence on the bus. And the master samples about midway or 30 microseconds into that time slot. If there's no presence signal, then the master presumes there are no slaves and it aborts any further communication. After each reset, all time slots start when the master pulls the bus low for a very short strobe, 1 to 15 microseconds. After that strobe, which is the clock strobe, if the master is going to write, it fills the time slot with data. So it holds the bus low to indicate 0, and it lets the bus float high to indicate a 1. If the master is reading, then the slave fills that time slot with the data. And everyone samples midway through the time slot or at 30 microseconds after the zero to one transition of the strobe. So that's the end of the part one video, which was the background on the one wire interface. In part two, I'm going to look at the actual waveforms for the one wire interface between our processor and the Dallas chip. So I hope this video was useful. Thanks for watching.